Uh, everyone, please have a seat. Welcome, everybody. It's a forum in August, unheard of, um, feels unfamiliar. Um, welcome, we're glad that you're here. We're doing this because we have the privilege of having as a guest here at St. Luke's this Sunday, Vicentia Kabe, who is the Bishop of Lesotho. Lesotho is a country surrounded by South Africa. So it's within, um, within is, is Swaziland also? Yes. Yeah, so both uh, Lesotho and Swaziland are surrounded by South Africa. They're kingdoms. Um, there is a king of Lesotho, um, who apparently is a Roman Catholic, but we're praying for him, right? <laughs> <laughs> and he might be watching. And he's a great supporter of the Anglican bishop of Lesotho, um, as, as one should be. Um, so in the world of, in my world, which you all should get to know, because I'm gonna be here with you all for a while, dumb luck is always on my side. And this is just dumb luck slash the Holy Spirit. Um, my friend Vicentia was gonna be in London for a part of the summer for the Lambeth Conference, and afterwards, we thought it'd be cool if she came here to get a break um, from all of the, <laughs> all the pressure of that. And then, then she found out that she would be the preacher at the Lambeth Conference, which meant that St. Luke's Church became the place where the preacher, the first woman to preach at the Lambeth Conference that opened the Lambeth Conference um, would be preaching the following Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliantly and carefully planned, of course, by us <laughs> as everything, everything here goes. So, Vicentia, welcome. Thank you. We're so glad that you're here. Um, so, I've heard from some of you that there's some curiosity about what a Lambeth conference is. Um, so, we're going to talk about that. There's no reason we should know, right? So, we're going to talk about that. Um, I bet there's some curiosity about the part of the world that Vicentia's in and what's going on what you think of us. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just gonna have a little conversation about that. And then there's a microphone over there, and that it's over there awkwardly so that the camera can see you. This is being live streamed. Um, and so it might, So I'm gonna, we're gonna have a little bit of a conversation, but plan to go up to that microphone and ask the questions you have so we can have a conversation that's useful to you. Is that all right? Yeah. Well, welcome, Vicentia. Thank you, Edie. We're so glad that you're here. Um, we, can we start by, will you, Tell us, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, where do you come from? How do you find yourself in Lesotho? Uh, wow. Where were you born? <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Soweto, in uh, Soweto, Johannesburg, uh, 1976, a very awkward time. Hmm. Um, I teased my parents and says, when your peers were out there fighting for the rights of other Ooh. young people, you got busy. Uh, and, and I was born October of 1976, uh, which makes me, I think, 46 years old. Um, went to school um, in Soweto because by that time, pre-94, um, other places of learning in the country were not open to all of us. Segregation was still part of it. Um, after high school, not even just after high school, I think I was 16 when suddenly felt a feeling that I could not describe. Um, didn't have vocabulary for it then, still don't have it now. And I went home and I said to my grandmother, you know, because I thought this was the brilliant thing to share with a grandmother, I want to be a priest. <laughs> she flipped. <laughs> <laughs> because for her was, where, and this was a question, where have you ever seen hmm. a woman being a priest? Because at that time in Southern Africa, there were no women priests. And her thing was, and you're not even done with high school and you're thinking of being a priest. Mm -hmm. So that was just ending the conversation there. But I, know, I knew later on that she went to talk to my parish priest, as I think uh, parents do when the children get complicated, to go to a priest <laughs> and say, help me out um, with this. So that's what started the journey that landed me in Lesotho now. Um, descending a vocation at that time. My father um, was just, I think, mild about this because he could have gotten angry that the only daughter, because I have four brothers, wants to be a priest. So his response was, so you want to be poor for the rest of your life. <laughs> you just want to be poor for the rest of your life. Um, and I think I said yes. <laughs> so you went on anyway. 
I went on, you know, poverty or, I don't know, I think this is when a vocation and a calling calls you, uh, God, God provides, God takes care of God's children, so I'm here. When you were, um, when it was time for you to actually study, to prepare to be a priest, were women ordained in South Af Southern Africa? It was still new um, at that time because the vote to, that was passed for women to be ordained was passed in 1992 and Desmond Tutu was the archbishop, the primate of Southern Africa. And it's because when he came into his episcopacy, archiepiscopacy, he had three things that he believed that would be part of his ministry. One was to end apartheid, two was to have a woman ordained, three was inclusion of LGBTIQ siblings into the church. Um, and which was the most difficult of those three? The, I mean, all three seem impossible. They seem all impossible. seem impossible. It's yeah. like having a dream and says, whatever happens, at least I told people I wanted to do this. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. But I, I think in his ministry, as we review it now after his passing, I think he did that. Yeah. It's left on us. Amazing. Yeah. Um, so what, when we met, you were the principal of the College of the Transfiguration, right? which was, is the seminary... Um, the kind of the regional seminary for the province of Southern Africa. Um, tell us about, about that role and what, what you learned about your church in that role. The College of Transfiguration was formed, established in 1993, and you could see Desmond Tutu in all of this. And this was to amalgamate all other institutions of, of, of learning, uh, theological colleges in Southern Africa. Because when they were formed, they were formed according to race, um, that segregation was still the, a thing, and the church did that to, to do that. Um, I think it was the times of, you know, signs of the time and, and, and things there. So Desmond Tutu and the church agreed that there'd be an amalgamation. So there was 1993, and in 2014, the church again um, makes a tough and bold decision appoints me to be the dean of the seminary, uh, which made me the first woman to lead a seminary, a former student of the college to lead the seminary. So besides just making sure that place survives, there was a legacy too in that. Um, the, and at that time, the Anglican Church of Southern Africa was just not only South Africa. It included, I think, five other countries, um, the Soto, Namibia, Swaziland, um, Angola, and Mozambique. Uh, it's only last year, September, that Angola and Mozambique started the new province, uh, the Lusophone uh, province. So that, you know, at that time when I was a principal, I led in that multicultural, multilingual, um, very challenging complex as we form um, priests for, for the Church of God. How many languages were there at the seminary? <laughs> South Africa on its own has 11. Yeah. Um, and so Lesotho and Swaziland will be included. And then you get, I think, Namibia has several um, of languages. Then Mozambique and Angola, so because it's just not only the English and Portuguese, the original languages that are spoken, and they were represented at the college. And to try to honor that, every Wednesday will have a Eucharist service in the language that was represented at the college, which made me a prophet. Uh, because then I could speak all kinds of languages. <laughs> How many languages do you speak? Six. Huh. Just like all the rest of us. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So tell us about Lesotho. Lesotho um, found its independence from the UK. When we were on the broad steps, I said 60, uh, 64, and someone says, we wish we were free by 64, mm. but we were free by 66 mm. from the UK. And so you can feel in the sort to of the remnant of um, the English and the UK government uh, systems that is still found there. We are, um, I think, led, because there's a government led by the king of Lesotho, uh, His Majesty King Litsia III, um, a brilliant and amazing leader. And there's a elections, and we are preparing for elections now in October, uh, where we will choose the government and the prime minister. And same in the uh, UK language, uh, it'd be uh, the government of his majesty. Um, so I think the king still has power, even though the subjects can still elect its own leadership. 
And what is the church like? I think the church is the anchor of the Basotho nation. Um, there are three major denominations there, the Roman Catholics, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, and the Anglicans. I, I say this in order because that's how, in terms of numbers, uh, we are. But I believe that soon the Anglicans Episcopalians will be the top um, because there's a leader who's very ambitious uh, <laughs> um, in that. And, and, and because of how the church was formed in that space, that it is a church that is not just only about Sunday, as you do here in St. Luke's, that the Diocese of Lesotho, the Episcopal Anglican church there, we have 215 schools. Wow. Um, we have a hospital. We have three clinics. Uh, we have a training center, a radio station. Um, and I think this is the work of the church, um, that we work to alleviate poverty, to make God known to God's people in different ways, and not to be the ones who always ask the government, what are you doing for us? Mm. I think the church has a role to play mm. in transforming people's lives. Do you think the church, I don't, I don't know in that context, do you think the church has a role in in influencing government as well, or would you say the church is distinct from that? Very much so. Um, and I think, I think the, the positions that we, we get given and the responsibilities that we're given in the church is not to assimilate, is not to be co-opted, is to chart a way forward. Hmm. And speaking truth to power is one of that. Being prophetic is one of that. And I think when the church abdicates from that responsibility, you will see that in our communities. In, in Lesotho, what are, what are the issues that, that you would see in the, that are for your church in the public square? Gender-based violence hmm. is high, and it has an, a cultural element into that. Um, so trying to deal with that, it, one has to dig deeper. Um, and I think as an outsider, there's some of the nuances that I might miss and not be aware of, so one has to immerse ones into the culture. The issue of unemployment, because we are surrounded, but our borders are all shared with South Africa, it means that South Africa can dictate a whole lot of that happens in the kingdom. Um, for a long time, um, men were migrant workers into South Africa in terms of the mining. So most of, most of the minings are closing now. Uh, either they stay in South Africa or return home, and there's no employment. But we have seen now women be migrant workers going into South Africa to do domestic work. So people who are caught up in this are children, who most of the time <laughs> have to raise themselves. Hmm. Um, so we're, again, the church has to come in in caring for the children in that. And I think politics, um, when government fights among itself or politicians fight among themselves, the poor people are caught up. What has to be done for the people is not done. So those are the issues that I think are pressing for us. And we actually have a question from your diocese, and then we're going to go to Lambeth. This is some, someone from your diocese has sent this to us. Um, apparently, we have a problem of young people leaving Anglican churches and joining charismatic churches. Mm -hmm. um, how do we stop that? That's basically what this is. <laughs> <laughs> this is one and this is people. someone from Lesotho? Hmm. This is not from us. I am not beholden to a denomination. Hmm. I will bless those who feel that they can find expression of faith in a different space. The worry will be, what is it that we shouldn't be doing that we're doing that is driving people out hmm. of our churches? And that calls us to do a deep introspection. So if young people are leaving because the church doesn't make room for young people to express their faith, to share their gifts with us, to, as I grew up in Soviet, we were, I think people thought this was just encouraging us, but it was not, to say children should be seen and not heard. Um, that I think is a dangerous aspect. Um, but if they're leaving the Anglican church because they don't like our ancient, amazing, wonderful hymns, they're mm -hmm. missing out. Uh, <laughs> they're only, um, because we cannot always be entertaining. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a moment of solemnity, the moment of being present, and the moment of focus. Um, but again, if they want entertainment, 
we can meet the whole Sunday so we can have different services as you do here mm -hmm. that accommodates that. There's room and space for that. And I think this opens for dialogue. Mm -hmm. What is it that we should be doing that we are not doing? Yeah. Yes, how do people meet God, right? Yeah. So to shift, um, uh, the Lambeth Conference. So you've, come, you've been here, it's been about a week. Mm -hmm. I don't know what perspective you have on it yet. Um, we, it didn't make a lot of news here, which is good. It wasn't <laughs> on the front page or anything. Um, so what, ha what happened? <laughs> we met, we ate, we prayed, we left. <laughs> I, I heard there were some difficult conversations, yeah? There was. Um, there were going to be difficult conversations um, because Lambeth happens once in 10 years. And in that, dioceses shift, nations change, things happen in our lives. So when we get together, it's not just a wonderful reunion, is that we need to talk about um, deep issues that affects all of us. 165 countries were represented at Lambeth because that's where the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church is found. Um, but a few days before we left, um, in one of the calls that we were going to deal with on human dignity, which had many other issues that were there in terms of slavery, reparations, discrimination, all about human dignity. One was pulled out and phrased and framed in a way that had so many. Um, and it was to affirm Lambeth Resolution, I think, of 2008, 1998? 98, 98. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, which, if you put, as the way they had put it, and say, this is the mind of the communion. I don't know whose mind was being presented or who was consulted mm. in the mm. whole of the communion mm. to put that. So it was speaking on behalf of the whole Anglican Church as if it's something that has been reaffirmed without getting into discussions. And so a lot of work was done in preparation that it was corrected, certain things had to change, but we didn't need to shy away from the discussion and conversation, because yeah. now it's here. Um, but hating each other um, without even having room to speak to each other, I don't think it's Christian-like. Yeah, how hurtful it is. It, that's yeah. a good way to put it, how yeah. hurtful it was. Yeah. So after, you know, having been in these conversations, what do you think is the way forward for inclusion um, within our communion? I think this is not something that can be done in a communion level. Mm -hmm. It's what we do in our communities. It's what we do in our homes. And I think it will start influencing. Because the minute we want to do things in that scale, we're going to decide up there and tell, mm -hmm. which I think is a difficult thing, to tell people what to do without making room to hear their lived experiences, uh, which are varied, um, interesting. Um, people wonder about this friendship, because we're so different. Uh, yes. But we learn uh, so much from each other. And I think this is where we change. Um, yes, bishops uh, have mitres. Um, <laughs> but you know they're governed by the canons. So we can't just arbitrarily do what we like. We'll be held accountable for that. What does inclusion look like in your context? Hmm. Everyone. No one is left out. No one is left behind. Everyone. Because when we start who we include and who we don't, um, at times I think we'll exclude ourselves. Hmm. Hmm. I just leave that there. Wow. Um, so yeah, the Lambeth Conference was created because because there were all of a sudden bishops outside of England, right? Outside of the UK, yeah. Canadians and South Africans, right? Um, and often Lambeth historically would frame issues that were about culture in theology or the Bible, mm -hmm. right? So the Colenso, really the dilemma that what was about how families were being organized, yes. and so then. But then he went to the Old Testament, Bishop Clenzo in Natal, so in South Africa, to make sense of what was happening in his yes. context. So you don't have to answer this if you don't want to, but do you, do you think the Lambeth Conference is a good thing? Does it have value? 
When you're a bishop, yes, you get out of the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> you get out of the troubled diocese for two weeks. That's, that's, that's wonderful. Does it help us? Does it help us as a communion? I think this is when, and some of the discussions that were happening as we were walking with each other, sharing meals with each other, is to say, from this Lambeth, and if we have the next Lambeth in 10 years' time, what would like that Lambeth to be? Is it all about bishops and spouses, some spouses? Or is it really about the whole church? And if it's about the whole church, who's missing in our gathering? And how do we bring them in? Do you all have questions? <laughs> do you have questions? Do you want to ask? There's a there microphone right there. I mean, but, and I'll just say, because we are very, very different people. Um, I, I value a church that has a, con a worldwide communion, and I hope we can always be a part of one. I get to be an Episcopalian because of the worldwide communion, <clears throat> right? I'm in Indian as a part of the communion, and we get to know each other because of this communion. We wouldn't know each other otherwise. Um, I think there's extraordinary value in it. And um, in, for those who aren't connected to somewhere acro across a border, um, often all we see in this country is, is hate. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how we change that, but I'm curious about how we change it. Mm. Horace, do you have a question? <laughs> <laughs> Morning, Bishop. Morning, Morning. You, I just want to say that your presence and your uh, consecration is one of the greatest things that we've done in our uh, Anglican communion. Aww. So we, we celebrate you. Thank you. So my question is, if, well, one, if you could just give a summary of that 1998 uh, Lambeth, what, I mean, what was really the kind of the sticking point of exclusion and what happened that took us back? Because around issues around sexual orientation, and we differed there, but when I talked with our presiding bishop, uh, Michael Curry, things were moving to the point, well, we will agree to disagree. So I wonder how, how, what transpired that took us back. Was there a particular person raising this, or have things moved in a way that maybe we're not aware? Yeah, yeah. I will answer that as not necessarily a bishop in the Anglican Church, but a scholar in canon law. Um, that this is the issue of uh, the, that resolution was based on the doctrine of the church, um, which says marriage is between, uh, I think for Southern context, Southern context, African with one wife and one husband, because you can have multiple if you want. Um, um, and, and taking it from scripture. But again, scripture is selective, because like, there are people with more wives and things there. Yeah. Um, so that was part of the doctrine of the church. Um, and with that, it goes back to context, how we interpret this. Tech got into the theologically and found ways of affirming and, and, and being ex inclusive. But others part of the province stick to that doctrine and say, if you change this, you change who we are as the communion and as the church. Um, but interpretation of scripture is central to this and how we understand it. Um, and you know that it depends on who taught you at theological college in the leaning that you take. Um, so I'm not sure what the design team of Lambeth was thinking about that, but I think as one of those when you go into a meeting and people say matters are rising from the last meeting, that was matters arising. It was not resolved. Um, those were the last Lambeth left broken, the last two Lambeth, mm -hmm. because of this issue. So I'm, I, I, I'm not sure how we will deal with it, but it's back to provinces. It has been back into provinces and general um, conventions. We have to deal with it in that level. Yeah, thank you. So if there are other questions, oh, good morning. Good morning. Um, so the Methodist Church is going through a similar struggle, and 
my limited awareness of uh, what the media is telling us about both struggles. But my question to you is, for those of us um, coming from a Western context where we have made some progress around LGBT issues in churches, and then encountering resistance from churches outside or beyond that Western context, what's the point where we look at the questions of colonization mm -hmm. and, and how we suddenly come up against each other mm -hmm. um, and this present day struggle. Uh, could you just help us understand that a little yeah. bit? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> and I think this is something that I found in the few days of Lambeth when this issue was framed as global south against the global north which meant that then the global south is predominantly black and African, um, hating the whites in the Western world, which I think already that was polarizing, and that was setting us up to fail. And, I, and speaking, once, if one wants to speak for the, for the global south, I think has to gather all the different views from the global south and present them as different views not one view. Because you know Southern Africa. Uh, we are who we are. Mm -hmm. We are the rainbow people of God. Mm -hmm. So that tells you all about us mm -hmm. um, uh, in there. But continuing to talk and finding each other, looking at our context and our history and our culture and saying, why do we pretend like this is new, but we know it's not? And having a voice to say, what is it that is going on? Um, so it's a lot of learning, but as you say, the media, the media will put what the media wants to put out there. I remember last, when I was in Lambeth reading one of the UK newspapers online, and they said the Anglican Church has voted against um, same-sex relations. I was like, which year? If they're reporting about this one, we didn't even vote. So the message has gone out that we have voted against. But that was not the true reflection of what was happening there. So again, who do we read, who do we listen, who do we trust, if we are not part of the cycle? So it's an ongoing process. Um, and I think for those of us in this generation, I think we have messed it, is how do we prepare the next generation to get it right? Uh, one yeah. I have a really big mouth. Um, I, wanted, I was really stricken by the fact that you have 250 um, <laughs> schools in this mountain kingdom, yes. which I've been really enjoying looking at pictures of. It's so beautiful, it doesn't look highly populated. Um, I have a couple questions like, is there a national school system? Or, uh, and are you adding on to it? Are you part of uh, a, a group of many churches who provide education? And what do students study? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big topic, but I mean, what are you looking for okay. once um, students are through with yeah. high school or mm -hmm. whatever you have? And if they go to a college, do they go in Lesotho? Or do they leave? And do they mostly go to South Africa? Yeah. Just how does it work? This? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I just counted that we as the Anglican Episcopalian Church has 215. The Roman Catholics has more than 600. So uh, the Seven Adventist has their own schools, the Methodist. So it, there's a whole lot of schools. There's a relationship between the churches and the government in terms of schools. It, it's not the best of relations, but we can do better. Um, as we do that. For Lesotho, uh, and I'm not sure what would be primary school equivalent in the States. Pri primary school. Primary, primary yeah. school, it's free. High school, then you pay a fee. So, mm -hmm. in an. Is it an expensive fee? Can, can people afford it? Uh, not all, oh. um, because of the issue of economics and unemployment. 
but for the church that has to look after these schools and there is no fee being paid, it means that majority of the schools that we have, I don't think I'll take my children to them. And I've seen them. They're not safe. Um, I worry about the teachers, and I've said them as I met with all the teachers in, this, to, uh, in our schools. I worry about your well-being and safety in the schools. So in the small budget that Lesotho Diocese has, the schools and the repairs and maintenance are not in it. So that's worrisome. The curricula is set by the, um, the government, and we are going through a process where our teachers are saying, we don't understand what has been asked of us here. So when a, a teacher says that, how are they sharing that information and teaching children? We're stepping in as the churches and says, can we do something better? Can we help out? Um, issues of getting study material, especially books. In South Africa, books are text. And now having to go through South Africa and pass the border, you're going to pay some tax. They become expensive. So those are the challenges that we're feeling. Um, there's one national university in, in, in the Soto and some other private colleges around. So majority will study outside of the country, and outside of the country is very broad. It's just not only South Africa. Um, majority will settle um, internationally. Some will come back. Um, but, but I've, there are fewer, and, and I maybe I haven't met them all, but those that I have met, when I said, when you're done with high school, <coughs> will you go to college and university? It's a dream too far. Hmm. They can dream about it, but they don't think it will happen hmm. unless th someone steps in and open the path. So that's a challenge when we look in terms of education, how we support everyone. Carol has a question. Um, good morning. Good morning. I just have one quick question, and, and that is, what do you think has been the singular impact of women in the church? Whoa. In the whole church? <laughs> <laughs> do you mean in Lesotho, Lesotho or everywhere? <laughs> in the whole church? Yeah. Sure, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, uh, ceremony of the Lambeth Conference. I saw a lot of men. Yes. I saw women too. So I wondered about that. Mm -hmm. Because as you said, uh, where change happens, or likely to happen, is more at the local level, yes. at the personal level, at the community level. And so I wondered what women specifically, especially in light of the changes that women are going through yeah. in our country particularly, mm. what have been the singular impacts that we've made or what do you, where do you think we can make We, we have made the Christians to have a problem with the lipstick. I think that's what it is, because all the linen now has lipstick. We look good. Is that the thing? Yes, we, we look good. And I, I think besides that, you, you, joking that is, there's been a different way of how we embody the gospel and tell our stories. There's a different voice on how we experience being children of God. And we have given voice to many who never even thought God can care for a woman. Because the context that you will be reminded, I'm not married by choice. Where when I show up, people want to know where's my husband. I was asked that in Lambeth. Mm. Where's, where's your husband? I like that sounds like a text in somewhere in the scripture somewhere. Mm. <laughs> if Jesus will be there, we said even the one you have is not yours. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the complication that we bring it's a wonderful addition to the church. Hmm. Men are still navigating, and that's why when you looked, is that women being ordained in some of our churches is still a problem. So just thinking of having one leading a diocese, mm. it's a problem. For Lesotho, it has made them to start to talk and to think, and I think to dream. 
because they've never had a woman leading in any level of the church. And there I come from Soweto. And I'm the bishop of the whole country, as I tell Winnie. It has brought a moment of saying, she's going to sit amongst the leaders of this country. So when I go there, I know that it's not just about me. My sister, my mother, my grandmother, my aunts will be in that table because of me. So it's no longer about us. I think the beauty that we have, we have brought in it. Thank you. So tell us about the, um, I'll just, just, I don't mean to embarrass you, but tell us about the, the, the names, the name you have been given by the king of Lesotho. So my, our friend at, when I was at Trinity, Mark Bazzuti Jones, who's just a ham, he's a priest. Um, uh, you can be renamed by a king, mm -hmm. right? A king has the power of naming. Yeah. So he got a name, I think he got made a prince, he got a title, he got stuff. So we've teased him about it forever, but you have actually, unlike Mark, properly been, the king has named you. What has, what has the king named you and what does it mean? On the day of my consecration, on the 5th of December, when the king got to speak, um, had a lot of amazing things and telling people that I've got her back. You mess with her, you mess with me. Mm -hmm. um, and in the moment of that, just kind of paused and, and, and said to his subjects mm -hmm. of that moment that this is Mabatu. Mabatu is a Sesotho name meaning mother of the nation. Mm -hmm. And it is interesting because he is called Rabasotu, the father of the Basotho nation. Mm -hmm. And it was an honor that he found that to be the name mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. that he gives me. And as a bishop, your last name changes when you're consecrated. You take the name of the diocese as your last name. So in Lesotho, is, uh, I'm known as Mabatu Lesotho, mm. uh, which really ties it. But not so long ago, I went to the royal village where all everything important about Basotho in Matsieng is there. And the people in the royal village said, we, we're not done with naming you. <laughs> you need a middle name. And, and this was, because Basotho, I'm sure when you looked into the internet, they love their blankets. They have beautiful, amazing, colorful blankets. So a blanket was bought for me, and it's a sign of welcome. And the name of the blanket is Tato Hatsi, meaning the beloved one, the favored one. Um, so those names, Mabato, Tato Hatsi, Lesotho, remind me and anchor me that I'm not here for myself. I'm here for the Basotho nation. Uh, to make God so known. beautiful. Yeah. Right? Oh my God. Yeah. So an another bishop um, of Lesotho was Desmond Tutu. Uh -huh. right? Desmond Tutu um, was made bishop to be the bishop of Lesotho. Um, so in, in, in the world of the heavy things you carry, right? And I have another. I have questions about other ones. Um, to to be a, an heir of to follow Tutu mm -hmm. um, and his radical vision of inclusion and justice. Yeah, tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Desmond Tutu was the Bishop of Lesotho from 76 to 78. And people still talk about the impact that he made in those two years. So, I need to do a miracle in two years. <laughs> so that I don't need long in this month's schedule. Um, and, and there had been a bishop, the fifth bishop of Lesotho, who was a South African too. But people, when I was elected, they focus immediately on saying, you're succeeding this month to do, forgetting there's other four in between mm -hmm. who were there. And I think to, talk about the heavy load, um, just after his death, 
um, his family notified me. He did write a note and wonderful things, congratulated me. He was very excited about that, frail as he was. But after his death, his family bought his, some of his vestments and his vestment back and said, Daddy wanted you to have this. Um, so that's, that's again, um, it's not just the thought. I have to put on the cope and the mitre that Desmond Tutu put as a reminder of carrying on. Um, so I cannot be silent. Yeah. So let's just stay with that theme. Um, you <coughs> stood in the pulpit of Canterbury Cathedral and preached to the, to the bishops of the Anglican Communion gathered mm -hmm. and to all of us. Um, what a what a moment! Or what a yeah. Um, you, I don't have a question. Tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's good when you ask a question because I can quickly think. What? Wow! I got an email around April requesting that I preach at Lambeth. I laughed when I saw that email. Was like <laughs> people really, really joke very bad. <laughs> I looked at it and I went on with work. And I went on with other emails and it's still there. So I read and I said, I'm sure they made a mistake by now, they should have retracted this email. So let me respond and say yes. They will say, oh, sorry, we didn't mean you. <laughs> <laughs> and like, who are you? Because <laughs> then I think five months in the, in the Episcopacy, so they really made a mistake. So I said, thank you so much for um, extending this invitation to me. I am humbled, and yes, I'm available to preach at Lambeth Conference. <laughs> In no time, the response came. Thank you so much, Bishop Habe. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury is excited that you have uh, said yes. And I'm like, I didn't mean it like that. I thought, <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were joking. And they're like, we will send you the material and things. Mm. Then I started crying. Mm. Why did I get myself into <laughs> to Lambeth? Do they know there's a Michael Curry who can preach? Mm. Mm. So it was, I started sitting down thinking of all the bishops mm. Mm. that I believe were worthy mm. of the moment. Mm. They didn't count myself here, which I'm surprised why I didn't think I'm worthy of that. That's a story for another day. Mm. So when the readings came and in preparation, and as someone like Canterbury doesn't leave you, you read, ev I read everything. I read even the criticism about previous sermons of Lambeth, which terrifies one. Mm. Uh, I read the negative, you know, media that was going on in terms of preparation for Lambeth, um, because I had to be true to the moment. Um, and one of the challenging thing about that was that the sermon was going to be in two weeks before I got to Lambeth. So when things were happening, <laughs> building up, I couldn't change the sermon. Mm -hmm. I had just to trust God. So one of the things as we processed, that long procession, mm -hmm. I remember saying, be present. Be present. This is the moment it will never be repeated again. Mm -hmm. Be here. Because I walked in looking at the floor because I was just like, I don't want anyone to see me. But when that happened, I started having eye contact mm -hmm. and taking it in. Mm -hmm. um, with the sermon, I remember when the verger took me, and I remember going those many steps up to the pulpit. I don't know what happened when I was there. <laughs> I can't remember much. I remember coming down and I had to stop midway and say, how long did I take there? Because hmm. it felt so short. Hmm. So I had to watch that later to hear what I was saying. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah. powerful. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. I'm happy to send it to you yeah. if you don't have it. It's amazing. Yeah. It was Thank amazing. You. I think you told us that um, our communion could heal the world if it chose yes. to. Yes. We have a choice. Um, as much as we choose in some spaces to hurt others, to overlook certain things, to pretend that certain issues are not issues, we still have a choice to do right. And again, it will be the communion 
doing that when we do it in local level. So then people will say, I want to be part of the Anglican Church, the Episcopal Church, because they love each other. Mm -hmm. They heal their communities. They serve their communities. All is welcome regardless. Mm -hmm. So as an individual, and as the leader of the Diocese of Lesotho, every morning I have to choose to love and serve that community, irrespective of what happens. So you can hear it. Bishop Kabe has a, a PhD, knows, um, has studied addiction and care of people that, are, that live with addiction, has an MBA, is working on an LLM, um, has so much uh, free time, right, to pursue these things. You can hear the canon law mind of, of how she's studying right now, but also is becoming a farmer. And Melba Hughes and I have a plan to get a cow to her. Um, she's got some goats and some chickens. Um, and, <laughs> I was living a wide variety of experiences in the Diocese of Lesotho all at the same time. Um, and is clearly, I hope you all could get a sense of what an inspiring person she is. So we hope this is the beginning of a, a long friendship um, between our communities. Um, I think some, some people have already said they're going, so you'll see them. I think they'll be visible. You'll see them when yes. you get there. Um, if you're watching online, um, please stay tuned. We have a sermon coming up soon. Um, can you all help um, to thank me, thank Vicentia for being here? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll see you in church. Should we head over? Yes. Yeah. Thank you.